Oh, yeah. Hello, Andrew. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Can I Hello, I'm going to, um, uh, hi, I'm, I'm Mike Grocott, I'm uh, chairing, hosting. I'm just going to check that we've all got, we can all hear each other. And I'm going to go across as, the, the, as you're listed on my, as it's come up on my Zoom. So, uh, Andrew, can you hear me? Andrew Packen, can you hear me? Andrew. Yeah, good. <laughs> Excellent. Kenny, can you hear me? Yep. Jacob? Yeah, I can. I can hear you. Excellent. Heather? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Lizzie? Yeah, can hear you. Brilliant. And who else we got? Uh, Olivia? Can you hear me, Olivia? I think you're muted. Yes, I can. Hello. Hi, um, Emma, can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Ware, I'm sorry, it's only your initial N. Can you hear me? Hi, uh, sorry, yeah, I'm just listening in. <laughs> uh, Dale, can you hear? Yes, I can hear, thanks. And uh, Kira. Can you hear? Kira Fenton. Hello, Kira, can you hear me? I can't. Kira, Hello? can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Oh, uh, yeah, I can hear you. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to uh, get started. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Um, this is the. Um, so we've been we've been kind of overwhelmed with abstract submissions, which is which is great for EBPON this year, and we're having to learn how to deal with it, uh, deal with abstracts in a virtual rather than face-to-face -face way, uh, which has generally been really positive. Um, because this is the last of the sessions, there's quite a few of us, so we may overrun the hour, and I apologise for that. Um, so there are there are I think there are there are up to ten people in this session, so I will crack on as soon as I can. Um, the plan is to do six minutes each with ideally one to two minutes of presentation and then leaving four to five minutes for questions and discussion. It's not the end of the world if you ever overrun your presentation, but there'll just be a bit less time for questions and discussion. I've got a PowerPoint presentation with all your uh, slides in there. Uh, so they'll come up in a, essentially a random order from your perspective. And I apologize, we, we plan next year to share those that presentation beforehand so you get a better idea of uh, when you're coming up and also what other people are talking about, but uh, we are learning by doing. So I will share my screen. Uh, we are recording this and if you, if you want us to remove your uh, presentation from that recording, then please let us know. Um, but the advantage is we can then stick it on the website so other people can find it and come and hear your presentation and find out what you've been doing. So hopefully that's a, a positive. But as I say, let us know if you'd rather not have it online. And similarly, we plan to put the PDFs of the posters online. Um, can you all see a single slide which says EBPOM abstract poster form? Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you. Great. Uh, so um, again, thanks for submitting. Uh, there are six poster finalists. And if you're a poster finalist, you'll definitely already know because we've been in communication with everyone. Uh, and that's out of uh, 120 originally submitted posters. So there's been a real surge in interest this year. Uh, the finalists will be presented on uh, the afternoons of, of Wednesday, next week and Thursday. And 
because we've now shifted to a virtual meeting, there are opportunities to present posters without actually going to various exotic places like Chicago, Dingle and Las Vegas. Um, and we will, those meetings will all be run virtually. And one of the things we'll be doing is offering the opportunity for people who attend all of them to have a certificate of perioperative care uh, if they document that attendance through our e-learning platform at the end of the year. So I'll, I'll crack on because there's quite a, a few of us in this session. Uh, and I'll give each of you as the slide comes up and you recognise it as your own, I'll give you just a moment to kind of compose yourself and then just let me know when you'd like to start and you'll have six minutes. So first up is um, Dr Fenton. Hello. Um, my colleague Dr Passy will try to join but he's just on a transfer to the QE so that might not be possible. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So he might be a bit busy. Um, so essentially what we noticed at the start of the COVID lockdown um, is that anecdotally there were a lot of increases in the number of necrotizing fasciitis and corneas cases. We thought this was quite interesting. Um, so we looked at the time period starting from COVID lockdown the 23rd of March and by going through sort of the CPOD or emergency case log books, um, we documented how many uh, cases of necrotizing fasciitis and corneas we'd noticed and compared that to the same time period from last year. Um, and what we noticed was um, there were six total cases um, that were taken to CPOD theatre in this four week period compared to one case previously. And there was one patient that was being palliated on the ward. Um, we didn't have any exclusion criteria for the patients we were looking at or anything like that. It was purely based on why they were going to theatre. Um, so, we then sort of had a look at overall the, the changes in the amount of emergency cases that were performed. Um, so in total, in the same time period in 2019, there were, hang on, I've got my actual figures here. There were 130, 140 odd cases. And this year there were only 67 within that four week time period. Um, when I was working on surgery, I noticed a lot that a lot of cholecystitis patients were actually just being sent home with oral antibiotics rather than being admitted for sort of, unless of course they were septic or anything like that, instead of being admitted for IVs and then potentially just going for an elective laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy. Um, what we also noticed was the type of surgery that was being done was different. Um, so based on the surgical guidelines, they recommended that uh, laparoscopic surgery was potentially an aerosol producing procedure um, due to the amount of the gas that was being um, pushed into the abdomen. So we noticed that there were absolutely no lap coles performed. They were all open cholecystectomies. And um, when it came to laparoscopic appendicectomies, um, there were 17 that were done last year um, and only I think one or two that were done this year. Um, they were all mostly done open um, and this was sort of based on the Royal College of Surgeons guidelines that was uh, administered to all the, the surgical trainees and consultants. Ooh. <laughs> um, you okay? Yeah. <laughs> all right, um, so like I said we noticed there are actually about a 500% increase in the number of necrotizing fasciitis cases. Um, the biggest thing we could think of that was contributing to this was likely that patients were presenting much later with a pathology, probably likely to uh, an element of fear coming to hospital and not wanting to catch coronavirus. Um, we didn't look into the comorbidities and things like that. So we didn't look if they were, you know, had, if they were immunocompromised or anything like diabetes or anything like that. So I think it might be important to sort of look at any confounding factors that may have contributed to them developing necrotizing fasciitis or um, being more susceptible to it. Um, so I think we'll probably follow that up and have a little look into um, how this has changed. <sighs> it's very warm where I am, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, oh, not, not. Great, is it, is, is, happy, have you, have you finished or, or, sorry? Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions, go for it. Excellent, um, can, can you just, what, where was, the necrotizing fasciitis. So is it, are these all abdominal infections or are some of them peripheral? Um, so from what I can vaguely remember from anecdotal, I think it was mostly abdominal. Um, there are a few scrotal ones as well. Um, right. I don't know if there's any affecting the limbs or anything like that. I think it was all abdominal or scrotal. And I mean, you know, for example, you commented on the you know, conservative management with oral antibiotics of uh, cholecystitis. Do, do the do the infection sites map onto the 
changes in practice or are, are, is that not, not sufficiently clear cut to say? I'd say that's probably not sufficiently clear cut to say at this point. I think it was purely, we just noticed there was a, a big spike in the number of cases. Um, we didn't break down, uh, break it down into site or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions from others on the call? Well, I've got one more question then. Um, <laughs> what what uh, do you know of the types of bugs involved uh, are similar or different to what you would normally experience? Uh, I'm not actually sure, but that's an interesting point. Um, I think that's certainly something we can look into and report back to you if you'd like um, to see if there's any, yeah, like you say, any different pathology that's that's happening. And I'll discuss it with the surgeons as well. I mean, I guess it's just inter it's interesting whether it's uh, it's COVID-19 related as in direct pathophysiological mechanism or it's indirectly related as you're suggesting in terms of delayed presentations and altered management. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I think from us, it was sort of a, this is the impression we get, but like I said, there could be absolutely some other confounding factors that warrant further investigation. And do, are you part of a trainee network? Uh, yeah, so I'm an F1 that was redeployed to anaesthetics and intensive care when coronavirus started because I did a rotation in it. Um, but I was also on surgery when it first started as well, so I saw, sort of saw it from both sides. Yeah, I mean, I get, it would be interesting to, to see if the finding was reliable and secure, as in consistent across lots of different centres or yeah. a quirk of your uh, environment. Yeah. And if it was, then, then really worth pursuing in some depth, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Thank you very much. That unfortunately you. is, your, is your six minutes, but but thank you very much for a great presentation. Thank you. Um, next up is Dr. Burton. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Thanks, Matthew. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Sorry, I, I joined a few minutes late. I'm just uh, at work at the moment, but. Hi, so I'm Matt, who's based out of Derriford in um, Plymouth. Um, so and today I'm just going to present my work that we've done over the last sort of couple of months looking at damage control surgery. Um, at Derriford, we've got or developed back in 2016 a um, damage control surgery protocol. And um, this is a uh, sort of data capture piece of paperwork or a performer that looks to help identify patients that sustain um, trauma through a variety of mechanisms um, and be able to fast track them down to our theatre complex for sort of prompt uh, damage control surgery. Um, the damage control surgery we do, as you may know, looks to sort of just try and minimise uh, the physiological disruption um, caused by the injury um, and which is the real main cause of morbidity and mortality in these patients. Um, so what we did is we captured all the um, OSOS uh, data capture paperwork, which you can see by the QR code in the sort of some right of your screen. Um, we captured all the protocols between November 2017 and September 2019, um, and then looked to analyze the demographics uh, initially with this piece of work, and as well as some sort of uh, basic physiological parameters, as well as things such as mortality. And there's a flow uh, chart of our time of events in the bottom left. Um, overall, we found that we sort of the patients triggering and activating this protocol with a median age of uh, 38 and a half years, um, predominantly male, uh, with quite sort of severe injuries with a median ISS of about 29, uh, sustained injuries from a range of mechanisms as seen there, mainly road traffic collisions, but also some falls. Um, and the operative was sort of a diverse but again predominating with general surgery due to uh, sort of mainly penetrating injuries and um, the sort of from this take home demographic study we can see it's a say a young population sustaining a variety of uh, sort of serious injuries causing sort of a lot of disruption to their uh, their physiology and as generally a poor outcome we had like a sort of 29 percent uh 30 day mortality quite high attendance in itu and also further uh, onward care to sort of rehabilitation, some, sometimes tert other tertiary centres too. Um, moving on beyond this, we've also started to collect some sort of physical data, basic blood gases, uh, transfusion data, um, and also level of sort of organ support. Um, 
palliative care stay as well. So looking for further prospective study, um, also looking to roll out to other centres in addition to Derriford too. Um, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Do, do you know, so I guess the, the notion is that it, through damage control surgery, as you, as you say in your background, the, the physiological disruption is minimised. Uh, is it possible to compare with either your own historical data or, or other comparable data to to understand if that if that follows through into for example their intensive care stay so you know for a given initial injury severity score do you get less sick patients arriving on icu after damage control surgery compared with more definitive operations yeah so we we haven't as i say despite us having the the protocol since 2016 we haven't actually collected any data regarding physiological parameters for our centre at all so this is hoping to be the start of that to look sort of both forward uh, and back in, as, as far as we're aware we're not sure of any other sort of trauma centres that are doing this in terms of collating sort of banks as well there may be but it, it's just not that we found so far. I mean it does sound like an initiative that would, would be well served to be across the tra tra trauma centres. Now we've got a, a supposedly coordinated network. Yeah, and I think there's, I say, we're trying to tap into that. We use um, our trauma team at the, at the hospital to look at things, that get get a bit of information off things such as TARN, um, but also looking at the, I think there's a, a national audit looking at uh, sort of surgical abdomen of uh, trauma and emergency um, um, laparotomies as well so things that we could start to sort of pull in as well but they are at the moment um, on the side and not not quite integrated yet thank you any any questions from other folk on the call you're all being very quiet today this afternoon <laughs> It's Andrew here from Leicester. Um, is there anything in that demographics that was a surprise for you? Did you learn something new? Yeah, I, I think the head of uh, patients, so I think our youngest patient was 18, but our eldest, uh, the oldest one um, that we found was in the sort of uh, late 70s, early 80s. Um, and the the surprise was that even the the older patients had had a higher ISF score, but did actually proceed to quite well out of it. Um, I think my preconception or my my bias was thinking that it would generally be the patients that would get taken to and do well out of this, and on the whole, the older patients would perhaps not fare as well or not be suitable candidates for. Uh, DCS surgery uh, that, that caught me off surprise and uh, I was wrong for, for that one off I'd, I'd like to see whether that is a trend or if that's just an isolated case great uh, thank you very much uh, that that's um, your six minutes up I'm afraid but um, great presentation thank you and um, <laughs> thanks thank you. for escaping from your clinical work you look like you're knee deep in um, yeah, next, right. up, <laughs> next up is Dr Pierce, I think. Anybody recognise this one? Prescription race and usages of opioid analgesics on discharge after general surgical procedures. Don't worry if not, we had a couple of people who, who had emailed us to say they weren't sure if they could make it, so I can come back to it if they join us later. Uh, next up is uh, Dr Coleman. Hello. Um so I'm Olivia Coleman. I'm from Melbourne in Australia, where it's currently quarter past midnight. Um, so apologies if I'm a little bit slow. Um, so I'm a resident currently working in anaesthetics uh, in Melbourne. Uh, and for our research, we did an audit of post-operative MET calls at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, which is a major trauma uh, tertiary centre in Melbourne. Um, from January of 2018 to December of 2018. So these were patients within 48 hours of the end of the surgical procedure. Um, so during the 12 months, there were 401 MET calls in 343 patients. Uh, similar to previous studies, most of these were for hypotension, quite a common thing after surgery and fasting. Um, and these count for approximately 40% of our MET calls. Um, most of these patients also had comorbid 
conditions, being an ASA 3 or more in most situations, um, commonly having cardiovascular or respiratory diseases. Uh, interestingly, over a quarter of the met calls that did occur were in this group of 48 patients who had up to four met calls within 48 hours. Um, so we're hoping with a bit further research and analysis of our data that we can kind of find uh, risk factors in these patients and identify these patients early before they have their procedures who might be cared for better in an HDU or ICU environment kind of from the get-go. Um, also in figure two up here, you can see that most MET calls occurred within kind of 12 hours of discharge from recovery and about a quarter of them happened in the first four hours. Uh, so identifying kind of interventions that we could put in place in recovery or in theatre to prevent these from happening, um, to kind of reduce costs and burden on the um, emergency response team. It's kind of another future direction for this research as well. Great, thank you. And, um, and uh, very well done for staying up to well after <laughs> Uh, very much appreciated. Oh, no worries. Um, and so, you I mean you mentioned that, that uh, there's a small group who are having multiple calls? Mm. Uh, are, are there any factors from what you know already that that would help identify those individuals? So you could think about sending them straight to ICU or somewhere similar. Yeah, interestingly, um, there was no significant difference in the demographic, so they didn't tend to be older or kind of more unwell prior to surgery. Um, they did tend to have kind of more orthopedic uh, or trauma kind of situations where they probably had more involved and longer procedures, um, but we're still kind of in the early phases of analysing everything. So no real clear indications as of yet, um, but it's likely that procedure complexity and duration do play a role. So blood blood loss is is sometimes a surrogate measure of of you know of complexity certainly. Mm. Yeah, um, that unfortunately that's one bit of data that's quite difficult to obtain. I suppose there's a lot of unrecorded blood loss and lots of you know bloody drapes and things that just get thrown in the bin and not counted. Um, so finding that kind of data in a retrospective fashion has proved quite difficult for us. Um, but one thing we are looking into is the amount of fluids that they got intra-op and in recovery and between recovery and the, the medical emergency team review, uh, which might be, I suppose, somewhat a slight indicator of how much they've lost as well. Not a great one, but, you know, how much treatment they got for something like that. Yeah. Sure. Excellent. Any questions from others on the call? Just a quick question from from me, please. Um, was there a was there certain certain uh, specialty or surgical specialty patients that were more frequently triggering met calls than others, or was it, did you identify a pattern to the procedures uh, that were more, more met call triggering? Um, from memory, I think some of the patients that had the three or four met calls, um, there were some who were complex flap reconstruction. So some combined plastics, head and neck patients who are getting um, kind of floor of mouth mandible resections and fibula reconstructions. Um, they tended to have quite a few multiple met calls, I think, just because of the massive physiological changes that occurred. Um, and then also the kind of complex orthopedic trauma patients as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Great. And, and do, you, do you know if this data, uh, you know, we have the trainee networks here. Do you know, do you know if, if uh, patterns are similar across other hospitals in your area? Uh, definitely the indication for met call is similar across other hospitals um, with hypertension being a very common one. Um, and then I think a lot of the met calls do occur pretty early after discharge from recovery as well so that's pretty consistent across the board is it the timing as in having a lot in the first few hours and the clustering does suggest that there are 
some patients that if you could just hang on, on for them a little bit longer and identify them a little bit better in them in enhanced care areas you might save a lot of effort through met calls definitely and i think there's there's a big push to get patients out of recovery onto the ward because you've got more patients coming out or recovery is closing um and i think identifying those who would benefit from a prolonged recovery or even step down from recovery phase would be quite um helpful to <coughs> and burdens and things. yeah Great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I hope you get a decent night's sleep. You don't have to get up. <laughs> Thank you very much. So next up is Dr. Radcliffe. Hi. Um, so yeah, I'm Emma, just to give you a little idea of my background. So I did a PhD and postdoc in cardiac muscle physiology. Um, and I'm now working at Harrogate District Hospital, uh, managing this service. So what I'm going to talk you through today is really a case study in exercise referral. Um, so we know that exercise has lots of benefits. It also has lots of specific benefits for cancer patients. Um, so the aim of this study was really to demonstrate the feasibility of establishing perioperative exercise referral in existing cancer pathways. So how we've done that, um, we were fortunate enough to get a funding award from a local charity, Yorkshire Cancer Research, and that was to support a pilot project over two years. Um, so we started with a three month um, setup phase um, during which we recruited staff. Um, and from there, the service, which is called Active Against Cancer, opened on the 15th of July um, last year, 2019. Um, so just to give you a bit of an idea, this is a community-based group exercise session service. We deliver prehabilitation, we deliver in-treatment exercise, and we deliver rehabilitation. Um, and what we've done in this study is to follow the performance of the service over its first six months. So this is July last year to mid-January 2020, so all the data is pre-COVID. Um, so if we look at figure one, um, we've tracked the referrals coming into the service and we've received just over 475 of an estimated 300, uh, 650 potential referrals, so quite a high number. Um, we've had a small percentage who have either declined to access the service or we've declined as an inappropriate referral. Um, we've got a slightly larger number of patients that we're unable to contact but the vast majority of patients, so over 65% are accessing this service. Um, if we look at 1B, we can see the rate of those referrals coming in, which is very steady and consistent over time. Um, and this really reflects the rate of cancer diagnoses in our trust, which is quite a small trust. So it's about 18 to 20 per week. Um, and then in 1C, we can split these down and see at what point these patients are being referred to us. So we have a really good um, mix between patients referred on to prehab, in treatment exercise, which we call maintenance or rehabilitation. Um, and then if we look at figure two, this is just to give you an idea of um, what we're able to offer and how much of that is being utilized by patients. So 2A, which is this bar chart at the bottom, um, just shows that we've been able to increase the number of places that we offer to patients um, quite steadily over this six month period, um, bar December, which is quite normal for the fitness industry. And um, January on this chart, we only recorded till mid January. So we did bounce back in January. Um, that also follows a trend of increasing patient demand over the first six months. Um, and you can also see in 2B here, um, which is looking at the regularity of patients accessing this service. Um, so this is a typical week. On this typical week, we had over 230 visits from 79 patients. And the median number of visits for this week and for the six months um, was two. So just to conclude, we would say it's feasible to embed a perioperative exercise referral service in these cancer pathways um, with high levels of referral and high levels of patient uptake. Um, and just to finally add that we are obviously tracking um, patient outcomes following this intervention, um, and we expect to see some results for that following the pandemic. I'm happy to take any questions. 
Great, thank you very much indeed. And just, this, so this is, it's exercise only, or is there, is there a little bit of nutrition and psychology as well? Yeah, um, so there's a little bit of both. We already had, or we're very fortunate to have existing um, psychological services and nutritional support for our oncology patients. Um, so really what we've done is bring those services together under one roof and sort of combine the input. Um, exercise was the bit that didn't already exist, so it's the bit we've added in. Um, but certainly they, they all go hand in hand. And uh, so, I mean, you very clearly mapped out that basically two thirds access the service, but once they've accessed it, what, what is adherence like in comparison with what you would, what you'd want them to do? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's quite good. It's better than, than what we would, what we anticipated. Um, our general dropout rates are probably somewhere between 10 and 20%. Um, but again, it, it sort of depends on personal circumstance. Um, but yeah, we would say adherence is quite high. Certainly all the feedback we've had from patients is that they enjoy it. They enjoy coming to the sessions. They found it useful. And anecdotally, which is all we can say at this stage, but they seem to be recovering better post-operatively. They're certainly back up on their feet sooner. They feel better. Um, we obviously want to show that more scientifically going forwards. Great. Any questions from others on the call? Um, Sandra again. Um, is this for pre-operative patients or are you covering chemotherapy and radiotherapy as well? Um, so we'll see both. We see all cancer patients within our trust. So um, we have prehab programs that are very surgically targeted. We also have prehab programs that are targeted towards chemo and radiotherapy patients. Um, so we see both. And how long are you managing to have people before they start treatment? Yeah, good question. Um, so again, it varies patient to patient. It depends if they're having some neoadjuvant treatment. Um, typically, we want to see them for a minimum of two weeks um, prior to a surgery date. And we are achieving that with the vast majority of patients. Um, with certain groups, it's slightly more difficult. Um, and I think the biggest barrier for us in overcoming that, that tight time frame is actually sort of um, the patients getting their head around what's happening and being in a psychological position to, you know, to make decisions and access the service. Great, thank you, Emma. I'm afraid we've, we've run out of time, but great presentation, thank you. Thanks. Next up uh, is, I guess, uh, Andrew, is that right? Ken is going to present. Okay. Great. Hello. Um, so this study in investigated the validity of non-exercise VO2 peak prediction equations that are used in um, CPET, uh, cardiopulmonary testing, and also uh, in assessing exercise limitations. Uh, so we used a large sample of preoperative patients from the University Hospitals of Leicester. We compared the T-tests uh, results, uh, uh, paired sample T-tests, uh, between measured VO2 peak, patients me measured VO2 peak, and also their predicted, uh, equation predicted VO2 peak. So uh, in table two here on the right, shows the results and also the population characteristics of the five equations that have been analyzed. Uh, the percent predicted is calculated by uh, measured VO2 peak over predicted VO2 peak times 100. So if, as we can see, uh, you know, it's the highest or the closest to 100 is 87 for male and 107 for female. And uh, some clinicians might know the Kupin Storer equation as BTS, British uh, Thoracic Society. And then on the left here, we have figure one. Uh, this bar chart represents the proportion of patients achieving different percentages of predicted VO2 peak. So, accepting some of that, some of the patients are very unwell. We don't, we don't expect them to all achieve 100% or the same percentage as each other. 
that the spread should within uh, should be spread within the normal physiological range. And if we take a look, uh, some of the results are outside of a normal physiological range. For example, um, if we use the Jones equation, that's uh, blue, uh, we can see that for some female patients, they achieved, uh, well, uh, they were predicted negative values. So Jones equation can, can sometimes result in negative predictions for VO2 peak, which is not plausible. Um, and also a lot of patient, no, no, a group of patients achieved over 500% of their predicted values. So the prediction errors might stem from the difference between sample populations used to, used to develop these equations and the surgical population. So for example, if we look at table two, the mean age, I'm sorry, table one, this is on the left, the mean age of the UHL surgical population is 71. That is a lot older than the sample population in any of the uh, equations on the right, like the mean, the mean age. And um, if we just look at Neda and Glasser, the two prediction equations that uh, have a higher limit of age, they go up to 80 and 85, they actually are the ones that have the highest correlation. So, so uh, therefore it's important for uh, clinicians when choosing an equation for their CPET that uh, they consider the background of these equations, the uh, population that was used to develop them. And overall in the study, NEDA provided the closest predictions, uh, but the study is ongoing and we plan to include other equations. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, how much clinical utility do you think these predictive equations have? How much clinical utility? Um, so currently, uh, these are used by the uh, CPET clinics. And um, there, there isn't a specific population or equation for uh, the, the, uh, the, surgery, the surgical patients that come through. So they have to use, they have to use uh, these uh, available ones that were develop, de developed using normal uh, healthy populations. Uh, so they, they, are, they are the closest, I think, available. I guess I'm just uh, struck. So the, if you, um, probably the majority of CPET folk in the UK are now perioperative, but there's you know still quite a lot of cardiologists and respiratory people, and the cardiology respiratory literature is much more focused on reference values and percentage reference values, and the perioperative has tended to be more focused on uh, absolute numbers, you know, maybe index for for body weight, but l less about percentage, uh, you know, of of predicted. And I suspect part of that is we don't have um, we don't have contemporary UK-based reference data really. Um, where, where, um, where, where, what do you plan to do with this next? Um, so, as you mentioned, there's a set of reference values that are currently missing. Um, the Dr. Packham's uh, data set is quite a large sample size, so. If, uh, if my project has the time to, uh, we, we plan to develop a set of reference values or our, our own equation. And you, I mean, you, uh, it sounds like a good project. You could also reach out and get, you know, there's a lot of other data around the UK that might be accessible for, for that. Um, I'm just, I was just looking at it, so it's very, uh, you may have heard the very sad news that Carl and Vassman died a couple of yeah. days ago, he's the author of one of those, um, but he died in his 80s. So, I mean, that, that literature in it, on its own is, is, I forget the publication date, but it's 40 odd years old. There's not a lot that's contemporary and, and nationally relevant and behavior patterns have changed and, you know, disease profiles have changed. So it sounds like a, a great project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is... Uh, Dr. McKinnon, 
is Dr. McKinnon on the call? Sorry, I just had to unmute. No problem. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, hello, I'm Heather McKinnon and I'm the project manager for the Fit Surgery um, service that we've implemented to support people across Leicestershire and Rutland to prepare for major cancer surgery. Um, we started in February this year and we had a multimodal approach utilising um, supervised exercise, dietetics and psychological support as well as some lifestyle advice um, and we've taken sort of five localities across the area and using two levels of um, service to support the patient's needs. Now we started in February, it was all going beautifully until March happened. Um, we had to quite quickly come up with a home-based version um, that it started off really quite basic. So we had patients that were in the service that we just needed to continue to support. So we started with paper-based and telephone support. And then as we've continued, um, we've kind of created a phone version of the assessment and then added in video conferencing to give us a me measure of physical function. Um, it's also introduced some, some challenges in that we've lost the ability to titrate exercise dose based on our CPET data. And I've lost almost all the objective data that I was planning to use to evaluate the service. I've also got massive amounts of heterogeneity based on the equipment that people are using because it has to be what they've got at home. On the positive side, all my patients converted to home-based and they've kind of anecdotally told me that they've really appreciated the support that the week phone calls has given them to um, you know, be safe during these uncertain times. Um, as you can see from figure three on the right, we had 38 referrals and 78% of those have converted into exercise in either the home base or the face to face. Um, we're continuing to deliver this intervention and we're really pleased with how positive it's been perceived by our patients. And we're currently working on our next steps of developing where we go now in the interesting times we live in. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. Um, I, it, so apologies, it, it's probably a personal obsession, but the, 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 what do you think your adherence has been? And have you had an, an opportunity to monitor that? Um, so, initial interest, as I said, was, was really quite positive. Um, while we were running the face-to-face -face sessions, I think our adherence was sitting somewhere around the 70% mark. Um, the home base, it's much more difficult to actively determine. Um, most patients are telling me that they're doing um, most things most weeks, um, but equally it's much less objectively measured at the moment. Um, but that's one of the things that we're looking at is actually looking at heart rate monitoring to give us that more objective measure of what our adherence actually is. And, and uh, for sort of personal interest, how, how, have you, have, have you had success getting local funding from your cancer networks or, or your trusts to support this during the COVID-19 um, crisis? Yeah, so we can have, we've got some startup funding from NHS England um, and we took this back to our project oversight group kind of when when things started happening in March and said you know is this something you're happy for us to continue to do and they took the approach that there are patients out there that need support um, we're hoping to be able to do kind of more of our initial model when the dust has settled so to speak um, but yeah they've been really positive in supporting this home base. Great any questions from others on the call? I have a question, uh, Mike, if I may. Um, I guess, Heather, I'm interested. Uh, you mentioned about heart rate monitoring, and one of your, um, I guess, issues was that you don't have the objective data from which to yeah. prescribe, prescribe the exercise. Um, depending on the choice of those devices and the protocols you use, there is a possibility to extract a, a subject, sorry, a submaximal uh, prediction. Um, from those uh, wearable technologies to, to, pr to pretty good effect. We're doing some of that at the National Centre right now. Um, so maybe we can hook up offline to discuss that further. But uh, I think there is a possibility to, to do both things, to motivate them during, but also to quantify um, a, a state of fitness. 
and that would be great and we're just starting to get some more sea pets going back again so but yes we won't be able to have that for everybody so that would be lovely thank you excellent any other questions from around the group not so much a question but more a comment just to say that so many of us doing so many similar things and i think all creating online resources and perhaps we should just all email and share afterwards Again, that would be great. Thank you very much. Yes. Excellent sentiment. <laughs> I completely agree. Okay, so that, that, that's pretty much time. Thank you very much indeed, Heather. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next slide, which is uh, Dr. Ashton. Hi, yeah, that's me. Um, so uh, I'm presenting a case where we uh, developed a teaching day for novice anaesthetists. It initially came about after a discussion with my peers, um, a group of anaesthetic trainees, basically recounting some horror stories of our first anaesthetic on calls and um, feeling generally a bit unprepared for them and that potentially that could have a impact on um, patient experience and, and the care that patients get. Um, even though anaesthetics is a, a very well supported specialty, we still felt that the jump from our novice period up to being less supported on call was quite significant. We um, initially sent out a survey to a few more of our peers to see whether that was a sentiment that was shared by others, which um, was confirmed. So then we went on to developing a teaching day um, to try and rectify that a little bit. Um, so the um, so we wanted it to be trainee led. We wanted um, our trainees' experiences to be able to um, lead what we were teaching because we thought that would make it most relevant to um, trainees first coming onto the on call rotor and kind of give them kind of a, a mentor um, type person to look up to. Um, we asked people what they felt most uncertain about who were coming, who registered to attend our course and we found that um, it was mainly the emergency scenarios and particularly kind of practical skills that although you might have seen as a novice you didn't really get a chance to have hands on play with the, the equipment beforehand. Um, so we used that information to um, sort out our timetable. So we had a, a morning of lecture based um, emergency scenarios like cardiac arrests cardiac cath labs, trauma calls, um, and kind of special cases. So um, what to do in acute severe asthma and people with low yes. Um, and then in the afternoon, we split up into smaller groups and we really wanted people to be able to get hands on with the equipment then. So kind of running through arterial lines, setting up oxy logs, um, practicing with water circuits and getting mannequins for central access. Um, and overall, we think it was a real success. Uh, we sent out a post course feedback survey and um, got really good results. Everyone um, felt that they would recommend the course to other people and the confidence of trainees going onto the on call rotor massively increased. We really wanted to um, run this course again for the August 2021, in, uh, August 2020, sorry, intake of novices, but um, given the current situation, we think that um, a face-to-face -face regional teaching session is probably not going to be practical. So we're hoping to um, develop some kind of app as we recognise that also with the current situation, teaching of novices is going to be very tricky in the upcoming months. Um, so we'd really like there to be some kind of um, resource available to them um, and hopefully we can reach more trainees that way as well. So that's our plan going forward. Great, thank you. Thanks. That was my first question was going to be, what, what's your plan for sustainability of this? I mean, it sounds like a great initiative, but, but so that it endures over multiple generations of uh, novices. Mm. Yeah, so initially the plan was to try and um, kind of recruit people who've attended in years before to come back and teach on it. And so things that they learned and then from the course and then they learn from their practice within the last year or so to then feed that into um, keeping it going. But I think we're, we're trying to kind of think on our feet a bit at the moment to keep it going and we might get those people involved to help um, develop um, part of the resource. So giving people a topic so they can write something for the app um, and then hopefully get that out for um, August ish. So it's available so we can um, publicize it to new novices from then. 
And has, has your deanery embraced this, or is it largely a uh, you know individually in, enthusiast-led project? I'd say probably more enthusiast-led project. It was well supported by um, the college tutor at Brighton and um, of, of the core trainees and the person who taught, uh, who's the teaching lead um, there. Um, I've since moved, we've all since moved hospitals and everyone who we've spoken to about it since then has also been very keen on us trying to implement something similar in the places we've gone to. So um, hopefully we'll be able to recruit more people and maybe um, speak to deaneries and hire up people about it. It sounds like it, it sounds like it should be part of the furniture as opposed to a... Absolutely, we, we think so. Uh, uh, and the final question for me is... Uh, any opportunity to include uh, simulation within it? We would love to do that. Um, yeah, we tried to do it um, the first time, um, but we had real trouble booking a, a sim suite and getting kind of um, the time to do that. But that's something we'd really like to be able to include in, in it. Great. Uh, any questions from others on the call? Okay, I will. Well done, uh, well done, Elizabeth. Um, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Chimelo. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is my name is Jakub. I'm a um, clinical research fellow in upper GI surgery from Newcastle upon Tyne, and I'm going to talk about study which I design and I've been running in the last one and a half years. It's called Chemofit and. It's this was designed as a very simple feasibility study to investigate um, our home-based prehabilitation uh, uh, regime for the patients who are receiving new adjuvant chemotherapy for their cancer of the gullet uh, and uh, stomach. So I'll be very brief. Uh, the intervention was based mainly around uh, walking and strengthening exercises. Uh, and we've achieved some fantastic um, results in terms of patient engagement and the compliance, which you can see in the results section of this poster. Uh, I'll be very, um, uh, I would be very happy to show you the secondary outcomes. I don't have them, but I'll be uh, very soon in position to analyze these. Uh, one of the secondary outcomes will be outcomes related to uh, CPEX uh, results. And I very strongly believe uh, that once these are analyzed, we'll be able to demonstrate uh, that our patients um, during the new adjuvant chemotherapy were at least able to maintain the fitness or some of them might have actually improved their fitness. We know that uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy is very detrimental in terms of the fitness. Um, so I think that would be quite a significant result. Thank you. Great, thank you very much indeed. Um, so uh, another great project. Um, how um, how intense do you, do you know from the, the pedometer data how intense the exercise was? Because obviously there's a lot of difference between ambling for a couple of each miles a day, a couple of miles each day over. True. So uh, so we prescribed intensity based on Borg scale, and we've asked our our patients, uh, so Borg scale is subjective, but very well used um, chart um, of the perceived exertion. Uh, we used a score on a, on a scale from one to 10. Uh, we prescribed this uh, in intervention in the range of three to four, which is moderate intensity or somewhat strong. Uh, so uh, uh, I would say I haven't analyzed this part of the data yet. Uh, obviously, they were not able always to achieve this. They were asked to uh, monitor, monitor this and, and, and uh, do that uh, in terms of the self-reported activity in their exercise diaries. And on a weekly basis, we were collecting those data. Uh, but uh, probably, I would say, more than, in, in more than 50% of the, of the days, they were able to, uh, to achieve that prescribed intensity. Uh, but actually, at the end of the day, I don't think it doesn't really matter how, what kind of intensity you're prescribing to them. If it, if it is going to improve their fitness, then it doesn't really matter, I think. Maybe I could uh, follow up on that one, Mike. Sorry, say that again. I, I missed that. I was just going to say maybe I could follow up on that uh, because if the 
if the pedometer you're using has uh, kind of onboard memory storage, it's probably saving the data in a, a an EPAC based time level, which would allow you to get a cadence measure um, from the data if it's not simply a kind of a set it and reset uh, analog device. But uh, I think yeah, it's it's like, it's extremely simple pedometer, yeah. which is sort of uh, it's it has data which which is called uh, aerobic data. Uh, but it has got only seven days memory, so uh, we were not collecting those, and that's, so, so this is lost. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't think that that really matters that much. And I have another. I mean, another question. Your adherence rates are remarkably good. Yes. Do you do you know why? I mean, do you think it's the yes, I, I think I think so. These patients are extremely motivated because they face the new diagnosis of the cancer. So this is important teachable moment for them. Uh, and and uh, as you can see in the method sections, uh, we were we weekly uh, in contact with them uh, on a telephone basis. So that provides loads of motivation uh, to carry on with the exercise. Uh, also, we haven't asked them to come to the hospital. So I understand that we are using some somewhat uh, controversial approach because it's very fashionable these days to exercise patients with a high intensity interval training. We are coming up with something com completely different, maybe controversial, but we believe that this will be much less costly. And if the, if the outcomes in terms of the fitness or in, maybe in the future post-operative outcomes are positive, then there's no reason why not to use such a simple exercise regime. Absolutely. Any other questions from people on the call? How are you getting the data back from the pedometers? Are the patients telling you or are you getting the yeah, data are, transferred? Yeah, yeah, patients are telling us. I understand that this, is, uh, this might be a problem uh, and we are thinking for the future uh, to use something like Fitbits, which uh, have got a uh, internet, uh, so, so, so clinician can have internet access to those uh, results as well. Great. Th thank you very much, Jakob. Uh, really nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, next up, and, and actually final, unless the person who we missed out earlier on has joined the call, uh, is Dr. Freeman, who also, I think I got some advance notice, may not be able to join us. So, Dr. Freeman, are you on the Zoom call? Dr. Freeman, might you be muted? No, okay, and I'm gonna scoot back. There was one more that we missed. Um, Dr. Pierce, or the prescription rates of opioid analgesics, have, have you joined us at all? Okay, no problem. We've, we thought we might have a couple of uh, no-shows for this particular session. Um, Thank you very much everybody for joining um any feedback because we've, we are very much learning by doing in this and you know it's a it's a very different experience doing these poster presentations online and virtually than than in a conference environment so any feedback positive or negative is very welcome um, e either by email if you don't feel like telling us now uh, afterwards or, or any comments now would be really useful can i just okay. say I, I think this is fantastic way how to present if we call them posters, uh, because otherwise in conference day, people go around those posters sometimes uh, unnoticed and um, the fact that actually uh, everybody has got opportunity to uh, at least spend one minute talking about their project is very, very interesting. Any other thoughts? I think, Mike, it really allows uh, us to reach out to our, our trainees. In this case, Kenny was able to present, uh, which he wouldn't be able to do in a face-to-face -face conference in many scenarios because the funding wouldn't allow. So in that sense, it's nice to get the next generation a chance uh, at the helm. Yeah, and, and I mean, both, both those comments have been have been reflected from a number of the other sessions. It, uh, it, it, it feels like it might be better than the real thing, strangely, which was not yeah. our initial expectation. No, um, we had one question. Really... Sorry, go ahead. 
I think the only thing I miss from the, the real thing, as you put it, is just that ability to browse a little bit. I, I appreciate I, if you post all the videos, I can watch kind of later, but just that ability to kind of stop and chat to people and know what other people are doing is, is kind of nice. But yes, no, it's excellent. Thank you. So to, to that point, one question we had was, would you mind if, if other people who were not presenting were also uh, observers of the session and maybe could post questions in the, in the comments, so, you know, the, the written comments bar? I think that would be fine and kind of that's what you would expect if, if we hadn't had COVID, so yes. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so really, really useful feedback. Um, we, we, there's a number of things we'll try and do next year or next time, in fact, because it will be before next year, and um, including trying to share the presentations beforehand so people have a feel for both the ordering and you know a bit of a chance to read through and, and uh, know what to expect. Um, but uh, really appreciate everybody joining us, uh, all the presentations and the commentary questions and discussion, and, um, and I hope some of you, or hopefully all of you, can get a chance to join us at least sometime during next week. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.